Do you think that I have come to bring peace to the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. To be honest with you, this is something I do not want to hear. The idea of Jesus bringing division goes against my grain. Jesus brings love and comfort and peace. Jesus is love, is comfort, is peace. The angels announce it at Jesus' birth. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those who he favors. But what happens when you bring the message of peace to a conflicted place? What happens when you bring the message of peace to a conflicted place? People will attack you. So let's think about that. In the course of his ministry, people of Jesus' own village try to throw him from a cliff. People from other places shun him. Religious and political leaders of the time conspire to kill him. And when they finally succeed in bringing him to trial and find nothing against him, the masses in Jerusalem scream, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate orders his execution. At the same time, many people celebrate Jesus wherever he goes. They shout Hosanna when he enters Jerusalem. A devoted group of women and men gather around him, support him, protect him, learn from him, and adore him. Many people meet him only once, but he changes their lives for the better, and they tell everybody they know about it. It it is very true. People's reactions to Jesus' presence are opposed to each other. Jesus does bring division. His message of love, comfort, and peace does not miraculously change broken humanity from power-hungry, money-greedy abusers to peaceful lovers of all and seekers of harmony. It does not. And it is no coincidence that especially those in power detest Jesus and seek to get rid of him. And those who live in poverty or sickness cling to him in despair and hope. Not to share wealth with poor is to steal, says Pope Francis. Not to share wealth with poor is to steal, says the Pope. These words convey hope, the hope that the rich are willing and able to share their wealth. The Gospel of Luke paints a darker picture. Not much hope is put on the willingness of the rich to share. Redistribution of wealth will only happen through God-enforced reversal of fate. Listen to Mary's song in Luke chapter 1. The Lord has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. And consider Jesus' teaching on the plain in Luke chapter 6. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. The Gospel of Luke promises reversal. The kingdom of God is where the poor and powerless are uplifted and, alas, the rich and powerful experience the bitter taste of poverty. Equally goes both ways, it seems. The vision of the Sermon on the Plains is that the poor experience riches and the rich experience poverty before all can settle in the realm of tree equality, true equality. If Jesus brings division and reversal, what does that mean for us? Are we even standing on Jesus' side? If we imagine ourselves in Jesus' time, whose side would we be on? Would we recognize the Savior, celebrate, support him, 
Or would we fight his message tooth and nails and try to get rid of him? Let's step into the time machine for a moment and imagine ourselves in Jesus' world. Are you Jesus' mother, Mary, faithfully at his side, whatever happens? Or are you Caiaphas, the high priest, who knows deep in his heart that Jesus is a destroyer of faith and society who needs to be conquered? Are you Simon Peter or Andrew, working men who follow Jesus' call without question? Or are you Governor Pilate, who believes Jesus to be innocent, but nevertheless condemns him for the greater good of law and order? Are you Mary Magdalene, a woman with a difficult past, who now is one of Jesus' closest friends? Or are you one in the crowd who screams, crucify him, crucify him? If we are honest to ourselves, we do not know on what side of the dividing line we would have been had we lived in Jesus' time. Would we have been on the side of Jesus or would we have been opposed to him? Of course, it makes us all warm and fuzzy inside to think that we would have been some of Jesus' most fervent supporters. Of course. And in hindsight, it's easy to think that, right? But if you are in the middle of things, sound judgment is not that easy. Jesus brings division and conflict and questions and doubt. The way to peace can only lead through the path of justice and equality. And that path is full of conflict. That path is full of people who cling to privilege and riches and do not want to let go of it whatever the cost might be. And it is full of people who have enough of suffering and danger and need and hunger and lives without opportunities and they demand to be heard and their voices can be loud and threatening. And the law, the law of all lands, really, it tends to favor those with power and privilege. And so Jesus, when standing with the vulnerable, stands on the other side of the law. We must realize that as followers of Jesus. Jesus stood on the wrong side of the law. His conviction was unjust, but it was lawful. How does that make you feel? I have a hard time imagining myself as an outlaw. Really, I do. But Jesus does not stand alone in this. Many people who followed in his footsteps accepted that being a fighter for the kingdom in their context made them to convicted felons. Religious and political leaders who are greatly admired today, whose statues adore many public places, like Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King Jr., Nelson Mandela, for example, they stood on the wrong side of the law. Even though in hindsight... They stood on the right side of justice. They were arrested many times because of their work towards equality for all people. As was Catholic Workers' Movement leader Dorothy Day when she protested for women's right to vote. And if you think about it, this was the fate of countless saints throughout history. Most saints stood up against flaws in their own society, and they paid for it dearly, oftentimes with imprisonment and execution. St. Catherine of Alexandria in Egypt, she lived in the early 4th century as daughter of the governor, so great position she had. She converted to Christianity after a vision of Jesus and Mary at age 14. She was a scholarly woman, and so she converted hundreds of people through discussion and reasoning. She was also a woman of courage, for when Roman Emperor Maxentius persecuted Christians, she went to him and rebuked him for his cruelty. For this, she was imprisoned. Maxentius sent philosophers into her cell, hoping that they would convert her to paganism. The opposite happened. She converted them to Christianity. She also converted the emperor's wife, Valeria Maximilla. 
St. Catherine paid for her success with torture and execution. She had done nothing but telling truth to power. Let's look at a second example, not as serious as the first one. St. John of the Cross, he lived in the 16th century in Spain. He was part of the Roman Catholic Reformation, which followed the Protestant Reformation. He was a friend and colleague of St. Teresa of Avila and took part in her efforts towards spiritual renewal, successfully leading the Carmelite order back to a life focused on prayer alone. Some of his brothers in the order did not like this new direction. Their way of dealing with the problem was not to discuss matters with him or his superior or something like that, write something against him, you know, work. No, they kidnapped him, threw him into a dark cell, and beat him up three times a week. And they did that for almost a year, and then he was able to escape. He had to endure this imprisonment solely because some people did not like what he believed in. Take some time to look at the life stories of saints. You will discover that spending time in prison, being tortured, assassinated, or executed is pretty common among the saintly. Do you think that I have come to bring peace to the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. Tellers of truth put themselves in danger. The path to peace and justice is full of danger and division. In hindsight, it is easy to have a clear and unobstructed view. While in the midst of things, the views are clouded, judgments difficult to make. In hindsight, it is easy to identify with Jesus' disciples like Mary, Mary Magdalene, Simon Peter, and Andrew. In hindsight, it is easy to judge Jesus' persecutors, Caiaphas and Pilate. But I believe that we all have parts of Caiaphas and Pilate in us, as well as parts of Mary and Andrew. It is important that we are honest to ourselves, that we acknowledge how tempting it is to respond to difficult situations with easy solutions, how tempting it is to blame others when we are at fault, how tempting it is to prefer false harmony to true discernment. Dr. King, in his letter from a Birmingham jail, defines negative peace as the absence of tension, and positive peace as the presence of justice. Negative peace, the absence of tension. Positive peace, the presence of justice. We oftentimes spend all our energy fighting for negative peace, the absence of tension, instead of fighting for positive peace, the presence of justice. But Jesus brings division in his ultimate quest for peace, positive peace. True peace cannot exist without justice. And justice means, according to Luke, the poor need more and the rich need less. Jesus shows us the way. His path is not easy, but it is true. It is the path which leads to peace. Amen.